Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, Lawrence B. Benenson, the Engelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. He graced the chambers of all-school meeting at my beloved alma mater, Phillips Academy in Andover, Massachusetts. A Juilliard-trained organist, Patrick Cabanda is a musician and international thought leader. He was a scholar at the Fletcher School, taught at Andover, has consulted for the World Bank, and contributed to the UN Development Project's recent reports on human development. He's now author of his first book, The Creative Wealth of Nations, out by Cambridge University Press, calling our attention to the essential role of imagination, creativity, and the arts to improve our collective economic livelihood. Kabanda brings a unique lens to Adam Smith's classic, The Wealth of Nations, for the new millennium. Without inspiration for imagination, the world is a dead place. Kabanda has presented in a very convincing way the role of creative industry and arts in the broad framework of development discourse. Anybody interested in economic development must read it. It gives a completely new perspective. Those last words from Nobel Peace Prize winning Mohammed Yunus. Patrick, it is a joy to be with you again. Oh, thank you, Alexander. It's great to be here. And I know you've been on tour internationally yes. in Europe, in Africa, now here in the U.S. Yes. What has been your takeaway so far, hearing people's reactions to the book? That a lot of people were like so happy to see that they've written it. I met um, one person at the Cambridge University bookstore who said, oh, you've written a book I should have written. I've been thinking about this. And, you know, I haven't, I've been procrastinating, so I'm glad you've written it. And I will probably be inspired to also pick up where you stopped and write something along those lines. So it's been wonderful to see that kind of response all over the world. What do you want to convey? Because the subtitle is a question. Mm. As your thesis yes. about the power arts can provide how the arts can be leveraged to advance economic health. Yes, so um, given that the subtitle is a question, can the arts advance development? That question sort of um, bequeaths one to say like, okay, what are the possibilities of how to do this? The great economist, Amartya Sen, who also I think is a philosopher, has uh, won the Nobel Prize in Economics, who wrote the forward to that book. He's really the first one economist who inspired me to look at this idea seriously, not just looking at the economic angle, because it's quite there and it's powerful, but also to look at the other non-monetary angle. And that is like the arts can help us build social capital. One example, maybe if you liked organ music so much, you approached me, <laughs> and then we became friends, and then you invited me to the show, and the show may help my book get noticed. And that's a very powerful example to show how just being friends through music can um, help us achieve those kinds of objectives or make connections and friends that way. But also, if you look at the area of arts education, as I talk about uh, discussing the book, Education should not just be like you get a job to work at Wall Street, but you should get a job that you can be a more informed citizen, uh, develop patience, uh, learn how to observe, and a discussion of observation comes up uh, quite strongly in that book. 
question things which are always being presented as maybe facts or truth when they are really not. And I think those are not generally um, going to make you make money as such, but they, maybe they may well, but they are important traits anyone who gets an education should. And arts education is one of our best ways to achieve something like that. It seems like Adam Smith's thesis yes. was never fully resolved in yes. his assertion that the free market could realize the bounty, the beautiful bounty of yes. equality, yeah. which, which was really the, the notion that free enterprise uh, economic competition could create um, a durably equitable society. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it occurred to me reading your book that it is creative wealth and the right kind of creative wealth that may actually generate the society that Smith envisioned. Yes, that's quite interesting because some people can have said that Adam Smith may be the first behavioral economics because that's a branch of economics which is, which is gaining more and more ground. <clears throat> but if you look at it, I think in Smith's time, there was an idea of division of labor, specialization. Smith talked about those kinds of things. And actually, Fried talked about trade, uh, being able to, for countries to trade with each other without all these you know, sort of barriers of some sort. But also by then, one can imagine one of the most important pieces of wealth was land. Things, if you had land, which is true to a certain extent, if you had land uh, all over the place, you are really very wealthy. And that, you know, all these people who are doing service and stuff were not really maybe as important as landowners. But today, most of our world runs on ideas. And as I talk in that book, you may have all these things in the world, but if you don't have the right mindset and ideas to see what you can do with them, I don't think you can do much. And when, when you look at the issue of human development, countries which tend to invest in people, about education, health, and things like that, tend to prosper more than countries that just want to build things. Because if you build things and people don't know how to use them or they can't envision building of that, then you're going to just be stuck. <laughs> In fact, the United States is a country which, being open to ideas, I think has benefited it so greatly. The reality is you can never quantify that effect of one's music yes. on the psyche. Yes. That is something that is not monetary. Yes. I think as so many people have pointed out, I actually point to a study on our thoughts by Joseph Nye who's of uh, soft power. Right. I don't know if you... Yes, of course, uh, Joseph Nye. <laughs> did take any courses yes. of his or read his work. But he did say something, and I think it was him or someone quoting him, that, you know, things like, you know, marriage. You know, when you marry someone, you don't say, oh, I love my wife 95.6%. <laughs> you just love that person. If you have a child and the child annoys you, you just say, oh, my life had diminished 2.5% from where it was. These things are not quantifiable. But yet, they are so important in our lives. So some of the most important things we have in our lives cannot be quantified. And I think that's something we should really <laughs> be appreciative of and try to seek out, always remember. Psychological, emotional connection yes. could triumph over anything. Yeah, I mean, I will tell you, I was in a discussion recently with a friend, and we were talking about people who have had things, or money or wealth, and it's all vanished. Part of it is lack of planning, but then you have people who have come from nowhere through their talents. And those talents can range from things like knowing how to play soccer very well, knowing how to plan instrument very well, or being a great teacher or being a great student. And if you look at it, it's to do with the mind. <laughs> so and I think that if um, you don't have a nice, a uh, good framework of how you can sort of plan for yourself or even take risks, those things all require imagination. And I think that creative implies Mindfulness. Yes. Yes. There is a creative definition in this country that is not, that is unmindful. <laughs> yes. Mindless. Yes. So can you talk to us about what mindful creativity means in the countries you looked at in this book? Yeah, mind creativity will mean <clears throat> that I will go to, for example, Paraguay, where I talk about students who made instruments from trash, that you see this landfill filled with all these I think thrown away and like what should we do with this stuff? 
you start making instruments, you start making cellos, violins, <laughs> uh, drums. And that's one example to show you how you can look at something which is really trash, but then actually make it into something better. And you can go to a place like New York, New Jersey, I mean, which has had troubles in itself. I think things have been improved. Someone said, let's try to build a performing arts center here. Not just building more malls and financial centers, but why a performing arts center? Because you are likely to draw in kids. You are likely to bring in people to see concerts. You are likely to make connections more possible in a creative way. Other than just saying, okay, well, we're going to have a factory which produces this and that and that, which is also great. I'm not saying we should not have that. But having these things like um, art centers can be very powerful in drawing in uh, young people and making the, commission, uh, the community more livable and enjoyable. I don't remember New York because it has a, near, it's near the airport. I remember it because it's near, it has the great uh, new, um, uh, new Jersey Performing Arts Center. And I think many other people will probably agree with that kind of analysis. A chemical equation where you inject creativity into the society and it produces sustainable growth. Well, um, there is a friend who has told me to try to go to Colombia. And I mentioned Colombia because I'm a big fan of Antanas Mocos, who was the mayor of uh, Bogota. And what he did, we don't know if we can measure it yet in what economics like to measure. They used to have traffic problems, and I think they still do, where people will be killed in traffic accidents. So what Antanas Mocos did was like, look, why don't we have mimes? take mimes and streets so people will start uh, making fun of bad drivers. Why don't we draw, um, put signs in the road where people have been killed? So if someone is driving fast and sees the signs, like, you know, someone was actually killed, they are slowed down. So you see, those kinds of things have helped so much. So I think uh, Bogota gets a point. When you look at study, which I think was an article which appeared in a Harvard Gazette or somewhere, or even actually Antanas Mokos himself writing in the New York Times. It's like the traffic uh, accidents dropped. Now, when you look at it economically, suppose I'm a father and I have five children and I'm mostly the bread yeah, winner. Is that the way you put it? If I go and, you know, get hit with a car and I have to go in the hospital, that actually, you know, <laughs> is a problem because then I won't be able to feed my family. School fees will be late and medical bills go up. So you can see by just improving a traffic situation, using the arts, not more police officers <laughs> or military police on the road, but things like the arts can, be, can go a long way in actually making a country do very well. But then the United States, you know, the United States is called the United States because it's not one um, <laughs> monolithic country. It's, there are many, many, um, many different Countries Personalities. That, yes, also. <laughs> Go to California. California is really running on the creativity. You know, look at the movie like Black Panther. So Black Panther has come out and it's making how many billions? You may know those figures <laughs> more than I do, but it's all about people's ideas and when you look at it, there are jobs created. And one of the examples which I thought was great was I think the Boston Globe uh, reported that people are now going on to buy African attire or things which look like they saw in Black Panther. And that's the way you can use creativity to actually even generate more economic growth. Yes. And if you were to say, based on this book, yes. make an argument to the American citizen that we should spend less on defense <laughs> and more on artistic design. Was it an American uh, president who said of a military industrial complex? Right. And that was a general. Teachers are starting to strike here. Uh, in some places because they are not paid well. Right. There is an American presidential candidate who went and said, oh, teachers don't create jobs. Right. <laughs> in that, you know, why should we pay them more? Why should we respect them? I think that's misguided. It's not right that, you know, a military, and again, I'm not saying that it's not um, great to, to have a gr the best military in the world, but, you know, let's look at how we spend and how other areas which are not well funded that we should also increase money to funding these areas. So how, how can we be inspired yes. by their ingenuity? And I think I'll go to somebody who I talk about in that book, um, Steve Jobs, if you're looking at just economic competitiveness. I'm not saying that Steve Jobs was the greatest guy. From what you read about him, I think he was not the easiest person to be around with. Right. But quite clearly, those of us who are looking at his intersection of humanities now, some people say he was a genius marketer, some people say he was an artist, but there was this thing about him really being very, very passionate about the humanities. 
and is, I think is the one who came up or um, advocated the concept that um, technology is not for technology as such. Through the concepts of design, which I think Steve Jobs was very, very passionate about, which came from the uh, uh, creative sort of uh, thinking, he was not just a great, wonderful software engineer, but how do they work in terms to serve your needs <laughs> as a human being and getting these creative ideas together? And, you know, I don't know how many people are for employees, but that's, I think, America's, one of America's greatest um, sort of companies we have today. So I think that creativity plays a strong, strong um, uh, sort of um, contribution to how the economy can run. Those kinds of things are not very easy to look at when you go to many schools. You go to, uh, some of us who go to music, we are, you are told you're going to starve to death. <laughs> you are told you're not, you're, not going to, you're not going to be able to pay rent. It, there's truth to that, but you have to recognize, for example, that the folk who started, I think, Air, B, and B, I think they were designing students at the Rhode Island School of Design. I haven't spoken to them to see what, whether they are creative ideas we are responsible for them to be successful. But when I had their uh, interview on NPR, I think that when, one of, when the suggestion came that they should start putting pictures on, on these rentals, the demand uh, went, went up. Now, people who take these pictures are using creativity. It's like, how can we show your apartment better that someone else will be at attracted to it and uh, sort of be able to rent it? So those are some of our very basic, <laughs> simple examples. Is there any data you found, though, about the livelihood, the appreciation of the artist's livelihood? Well, what I will go back to, um, and I think others, even including Amatya Sen, have already talked about this. When you go to a country like Uganda, you know, resources are very scarce, generally, and as in many other countries, our low-income countries or countries which are mid-income, or even in rich countries. What makes people happy, mostly? Go to a music uh, festivals. <laughs> now, the trouble is that we have not been able to monetize that. I think now we have tools with uh, the social media and things that I can see. Okay, if people point on this like, know that likes will mean anything. Will that be able to give us data to show that actually people are more responsive to artistic things? They are more likely to be uh, interested in what's going on if there's an artistic component. In terms of data, what I can tell you is that Uganda had terrible um, um, issues with AIDS, the HIV, AIDS, HIV um, virus. And this was in the, 19, uh, in the 80s, and I was a young person, so you know it was a big problem, and you get politicians to go talk about this. But I'll tell you who was more effective at actually informing young people about this it was a singer I mentioned in that book called Phil Retire, who went out and sang and told, said, you know, look, you have to be careful. This is a true disease through his music and drawing that kind of attention. Now, when you look at some data, it shows that the numbers actually went down. What we may not know whether it's true that Phil, Phil Retire was able to contribute to that coming down of that. AIDS crisis, or there are many other factors, but what I can know is that his contribution was immense because most of his concerts were always packed. <laughs> right. People were going in because they are drawn to the message. It, was, it would be very different if the uh, president of the country went and gave speech after speech. <laughs> you identify that song and dance yes. and music are becoming a critical mechanism to teaching communities about climate change. Yes. And uh, that seems to be where there is potential for the alignment of economic generation yes. and communities of gentrification. Yes. Uh, are there stories that you can relay to our viewers about how that environmental consciousness contributed to uh, the greening of both the, the entities and the enrichment of those communities for the long term? Is it happening? I think it's happening. What will be interesting, because these are all new, we are just starting to pay attention. And that's why I was lucky to, to write that book. I think it uh, takes yes. a quick moment. Uh, we, we, we need to just regardless and start to collecting data. But uh, what I'll, I can tell you is that about maybe six months or three months ago or so, I read an article saying that in um, 
island of Zanzibar or around there or Madagascar, around there on the coast of East Africa, people are getting plastic bottles. Because even in the United States, you know, the bottles we use to drink water soda end up mostly on the shores right. <laughs> of rivers and lakes and or water bodies. So there's a group of artists, not politicians, artists, who went and said, well, why don't we get these bottles, <laughs> create a boat, <laughs> um, and get this boat and get people to still start sailing in it. Right. So they are getting the trash, <laughs> making something useful out of it. Because, you know, of course, you know, one could argue that recycling bottles is expensive anyway, so we should just throw them. But do they really belong to the beach or, <laughs> or some water body somewhere? No. So artists said, look, let's get this and turn it into a, uh, kind of something useful, a treasure. And you can go, I think, now as a tourist <laughs> and go on this boat and, you know, cruise around. So that's one example. But I think when I go back to Paraguay, it shows you that they have a slogan which says the world sends us garbage. Uh, it's, yeah, yeah, the world sends us garbage, we send back music. You know, landfills, when you look at some places, contribute a lot because they are, they are there, there are chemical reactions going on, these gases are fuming. If it's true that they are able to sort of, sort of get this uh, trash and make things like instruments out of them, great. Those are micro examples. But then when you look at it, uh, the concept itself, which I was hoping to draw from the book, maybe we should see that recycling is actually not so bad. So when you get something, how can you see that you, you recycle it? That, it may not be good for the market because in pure economic terms, the more I buy plastic bags, <laughs> the more it's good for the plastic bag right. industry. That's not difficult to see. But is it, if I just keep on throwing them and going, <laughs> they're ending up in the trash or somewhere you know, on the river banks, is that, does that make sense? So, um, and what can we do to be creative? Some people- Well, you, you envision <laughs> creativeria. Creativeria <laughs> is your <laughs> yes. fictional country, country <laughs> where the arts are valued and endowed yes. with that economic potency. Yes. Yes. Uh, how can you argue mm -hmm. that creativeria is a viable concept? and is not a utopian idea. Yeah, so uh, you know that was inspired by Silent Spring. I'm a big fan of Rachel Carson since we're talking of um, yes. uh, climate change. Right. She's definitely, that book, Silent Spring, really is one of the books which changed my life in a way. I, I was amazed how she was able to pull it off. And if you've read that book, you see how she got all this data contested, and it's very readable. But she starts out with this, imaginary place in the introduction. Right. So I'm like, hmm, why don't I get the same kind of imaginary <laughs> kind of thing? And what I want to get to is the issues I get to later is that, okay, let's fund arts education to get kids to be interested. Maybe they will be the next ones who design a board which will be made of this trash. Right, a cultural trade index. Yes. Yeah, so they're that, tied together. Yeah, so that, that index may be like, for example, one of the things we're struggling with, with some of us who are trying to say, that let's get the data to prove the things going on. Not, I should make a point though, that not, it's not that if we get the data, people, people will act. People definitely sometimes want to go with right. the things they believe in. If you present them, look at what we have in the United States. Yes, that yes, is, this We is have true. all the information, <laughs> but we are still, so, but at the same time, there's an argument that let's try to start collecting and use it where we can. You talked of, I think, uh, schools. Maybe at Andover it would be a useful thing for people to teach about. The cultural trade index may tell us okay, which country in the world actually does recycle more and export recycled materials, which have been um, basically trash, but they are exporting them to be put into creative things, maybe uh, used for frames and car designs. We can look at that. We can look at the culture trade index, because if you design something, let's assume you are an architect, and you, you go and design the most climate-friendly building, and you are an American who travels around the world. You know that's a service export. Which country has more of those kinds of designers? <laughs> can we come to that? And then the other thing we can look at, okay, which country in the world actually has stronger uh, intellectual property protections that people who are exporting their creative output end up being more... And those uh, countries those are country. able to preserve <laughs> yes, yes. the talents of yes. such artists. Yeah, so, so basically that index would be that. And it can be also purely instrumental, like, okay, well, I noticed that the United States... Um, 
uh, sells more movies to Africa. How many movies does Nollywood sell to the United States? We can't tell that. Okay, when we look at production now, we know that I think Hollywood is number one, followed by Bollywood, which I talk about, and Nollywood. So we have that in terms of production. When we try to correlate with GDP and population, maybe it will be different because America's GDP is in the trillions, Nigeria is not. Then we start to compare and contrast, divide. Then you may be, maybe Nigeria will be on top. So that index will probably is, is just a way, technical tool to get us to get there. <laughs> Patrick, you are a national and international treasure. Do you have anything more to add other than this joyous occasion of us being back together? Oh, I mean, I just want to thank you so much for giving you an opportunity to be here and thank your audience thank for you. uh, being interested in the topic. And Creativeria. Is yes. Yeah, we'll maybe all, around the corner. Yeah, we'll all get on a citizenship in Creativeria. Yeah. And the other thing is that um, it will be great to continue funding arts education getting recognizing artists um if those who are not the michael jackson of the world uh free and the, the max myers of the world, <laughs> right yes exactly yeah. and also things like making sure that we appreciate be on, be on the lookout of how the arts enrich our lives daily without even noticing and lastly and finally yes is there's always a great um uh question which comes out oh show us how the arts can contribute to ABCDE. Right. But I think there's also a great way to be like, okay, well, how can we find out those things which you can't measure, how the arts enrich us? As I said in that book, if people do that, I will tap dance even if my <laughs> feet may itch. I think it will be great. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, Patrick. Thank you so much. Yes. And thanks to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time for a thoughtful excursion into the world of ideas. Until then, keep an open mind. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash Open Mind to view this program online or to access over 1,500 other interviews. And do check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Open Mind TV for updates on future programming. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, Lawrence B. Benenson, the Engelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.